Okay, good day, everyone. Uh, we're doing our jail weekly, bi weekly production users call. It's 2023, June 28th. Uh, we have Michael, Jamie, uh, myself, Antranig, Jan, John, and Dan. And Dan is not at the beach this time to make us envy him. Uh, so we'll get started. Uh, last week, whoever did join, we went very deep into a lot of things, including talking with uh Shivank about his patch let's see if something got updated there and then me and uh Jan went for around a, more than an hour talking about CPU pinning and idle processing uh I something that a lot of us apparently don't know uh CPU pinning CPU sets idle processing and uh real-time processing so uh if you have any questions you would find them in the notes below uh so yeah let's see what we have uh, this week for production users. Uh, jail Mac policy progress with Shivank. Anyone knows anything about that? Reviews.freebs.org. Do we have any new thing happening in there? Uh, I'm, I, Shivank, Amy, it sounds us. like no. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. I'm afraid things are still a no with me. Just have not really gotten to anything for EBSD this week. And if Dave jumps in, he might have an update on if Shivanka is using his VM that he provided. So there's that. Okay, okay, sounds good. Well, he did tell us that he has a couple of issues and he will try to debug them and let us know. So uh, we'll just ping him again and see if there's anything we can help him out with. And we did open up a, a working section down here in case he has any questions. Dietrich was giving the cold trace, I and but I figured it was not helping much. So here is what he has been working on. D message logs when setting up the command. So it means either GLD cred is expected or something is messed up. So at the end of the day, his problem was that a jail a process was that that is indeed jailed was reporting that it was not jailed. Uh, so we, we don't know why that happened. So maybe we'll, we will follow up with him and try to help him out. That's regarding the Mac policy. Uh, update 14.0 release schedule, apparently. We got an email about this? I, I didn't receive, I, I, I think- That was on the current mailing list. Oh, on the current mailing list, okay. So, um, what was changed on the website, June 26? That was two days ago. Okay, okay. So we're expecting schedule reminder in the 21st of July and, and we will have a branch in, uh, let's see, in 18th and then hopefully the release branch, let's see, the actual release is gonna be on October. So we, we delayed it for what, three months apparently? Less or so, okay. Yep. Okay, uh, J Jamie, you had comments here, right? Like but things might go in. What is going in there? I'm hoping to uh, be able to, yeah, for for uh, jail descriptors is the only uh, KBI change, KBI level change I, I have in mind. And, okay. you know, we, we could, uh, the, uh, the things to the, uh, the jail eight commands can, have a uh, easier schedule because it's only the August 4th code slush that uh, it's really only kernel things that uh, matter at that point. I see. I see. So, 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 so one of the changes that you did was the, uh, the include that. Yeah. And that needs some fixing again. up. Okay. That needs just fixing up. Okay. But, but it is definitely going into 14. Yes. Yes. And another one yeah, was yeah, that's already in current. So we have what a KPI change. Um, if I want to do a uh, jail descriptions, that would be a KBI change. Okay. Okay. Uh, that is not pushed, right? That is not pushed. That is not <laughs> even coded yet fully. So I haven't okay. put in any in, in differential, but I've, I've partially coded it. Okay. Okay. That sounds good. Uh, what does that do? Uh, what that does is, um, you have two different, uh, kinds of jail descriptors that I'm looking at. One are like the process descriptors that when a jail is created, you have a descriptor that when it closes, the jail closes, mm -hmm. and the jail gets removed basically. 
And then I have some that you can just just have a jail view. And when you close it, all you're doing is no longer accessing the jail. Mm. And the um, attach and remove command um, system calls would have descriptor equivalents. Mm. And the jail set and jail get has an extra parameter where you can specify a descriptor instead. So In particular, you can take an existing jail and mm -hmm. get a descriptor from it, which mm -hmm. is something that you can't do with process descriptors. Don't know why they don't have something where you can turn a PID into a descriptor, but they didn't feel the need to. But it seems very useful and an easy enough okay. thing to implement. Would that work outside of jail? Yeah. Cool. That's nice. I think the reason why they didn't do it is that it started out as uh, part of Capsicum. Yeah. And within the mindset of Capsicum, the other function is meaningless because it wouldn't be available to you either anyway once you enter the sandbox mode. Yeah, that's true. And yeah, and it wouldn't, and I've, this is a part I haven't coded, but yeah, I would also have it, yeah, not something you couldn't do in sandbox mode. Because I do plan on adding the Capsicum to this, parts to this, I mean, might as well. Mm -hmm. And, and, and to be clear, um, uh, the, currently the jail command is not capsicumized, right? Right. Okay, that, that's good to know. We, uh, Which, do, you, do you think there's like a, 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 like would capsicumizing it would eliminate any attack vectors that we might have? Or well, I think the way <laughs> it's not capsicumized is that it is just wholly not allowed. But I haven't actually looked into that. Got that. So with so with the APIs we have so far and how Capsicum works, there is no point in adding Capsicum mass jails or jail to Capsicum support or in any form because basically once you're inside capability mode, you can't leave it and your uh, any new child processes will inherit the sandbox state. So you can really use the jail command that way. Instead, what would be a useful configuration to run a capsicumized service inside a jail, but it makes sense to do this in two steps and not in one utility. It does just to, uh, yeah, just for coding this purposes. This may change with ca uh, jail descriptors if they're fully unprivileged, where you would want to have some kind of sub sandbox, basically. But that's really out there as a design point. And Capsicum is already underutilized as it is, and they don't see how it makes it easier to port existing code. So it would basically uh, be an academic exercise rather than a useful defense in depth feature. Yeah, I was going to yeah, say that too. So. Yeah, absolutely agree. Unfortunately, Capsicum compared to all the other Capsicum alike tools like uh, Pledge on OpenBSD, right? C Capsicum is a nightmare, and Pledge is like like you can understand what you're doing, and Capsicum uh, seems Capsicum... a lot more complicated. It's very invasive to existing code because it removes all um, all um, shared namespaces. Mm -hmm. And it's not hard to write a new application again within Capsicum. It's almost the same. The problem is that you have to get it right for it to even basically compile and start up. Yeah. And with other sandboxing mechanisms, you can slowly debug your sandbox Box configuration, whereas with Capsicum, there's uh, basically the big bang problem where you have to start and get it right the first time, which is why it's hard to retrofit to non trivial code bases. Um, do we have Capsicum examples in the code base, by the way? As in, you know, examples slash Capsicum. PCP dump, ping. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, both of them are Capsicumized and both of them are complex software. So, no, ping is pretty simple. But, uh, and TCP dump is a nice example because it does, 
a lot of very dangerous things by design, mm -hmm. namely parsing 10,000 different binary protocols in C, mm -hmm. uh, which is a gigantic attack surface. But its interaction with the kernel, its intended interaction is fairly simple. Take the filter expression, compile it, open a BPF device, attach to it, and only once all of the setup is done, inspect the traffic. So there's a clear order where you basically lock it down and then you enter the sandbox before you look at the first network packet. Got it. And that's a good design choice and why TCP dump was a forgiving code base to retrofit this too. Beautifully put. Yeah. Um, otherwise, grab for the capsicum functions uh, in the user space sources. And something else to look out for is that you don't have to enter capability mode to restrict file descriptors. Mm -hmm. So you can use uh, the capsicum functionality, for example, to take a file, uh, a socket, uh, file descriptor and wrap it in such a way that the only allowed operation on it is to receive it and close it. Mm. Then inherit yeah. this so that you can't change the locking or on a device descriptor that you can only do one or two ioctals and not the dangerous ones. Mm -hmm. So you can lock it down even within the normal ABI with the shared namespaces and get better security that way. If we have time for it later, I can explain a crazy thing you can do with this to uh, work around the need for a mounted file system for Unix sockets. But mounted for Unix sockets. It's just a way to bootstrap the system. Hmm. Jan, but, can you think of a great example of uh, just a reference for file descriptors, Unix sockets, and IOCTLs beyond the perhaps design and implementation book? Uh, which part of it? Using them, understanding uh, how Understanding the concepts for those of us who, yeah, let's not go there. Uh, the device drivers book, FreeBSD device drivers okay. of Intrepid. From, yeah. But cool. it's 10 years old by now, so... Fundamentals probably so, haven't changed. Yeah, no, they haven't. And the other thing is uh, the uh, OpenBSD IMSG framework for the multi-process demons, like their BGP speaker and so on, IMSG. Okay, cool. Uh, I think that's what it's called. Oh, Joseph Hong, was it? I do have that book across the room for device drivers. Cool, thank you. IMSG or MSG? Yeah, just a pen and underscore in it exactly. Yeah. Oh, cool. It's been the problem is that, yeah. Cool. You can Thank do you. a lot of things with it, but it would really uh, derail it. So we should put this to the oh, end. Yeah, now's the time. That's why I just wanted a pointer. Thank you for that. Sounds, Sounds like reading. So um, anything else on this part for the release? Anyone expecting anything? Which, which does give me a good question. So like we, we uh, and uh, apologies, I'm, I'm kind of a noob about the release engineering part. Or can we expect that jamies.include is going to be included in the other FreeBSD versions like 13 and 12? Oh, MFC. Mm, only uh, someone. I may. That's, it's not a huge change. So it, it it may be MFC'd. That that would just be. I mean, it could be. That would just be a decision to make. Okay, because 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 the, the jail because the jail. Uh, it wouldn't box. go into twelve, but you know, it might go into a thirteen. Thirteen, yeah. Depending on how much more thirteen there is to go. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's a good point. Okay, got it. Yeah, because the thirteen. Uh, I still up. have thirteen point thirteen, as far as we can tell, right? Yeah, thirteen point. So sorry, thirteen point three might still come out. Yeah. So, so 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 12.4 will be the last 12.4 yeah the last 12 i think i, I think so I, yeah i haven't heard any of of any new uh, 13 releases being planned but then i don't really keep an ear to the ground on the release planning 
I think the release engineering team is quite busy right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah they, they've got their hands full, that's for sure. That's for sure. That's, that's for sure. Okay. Okay. Okay, that sounds very much interesting. Okay, that sounds awesome. Uh, well, thank you everyone who has contributed to 14 and uh, to, and not thank you very much to OpenSSL, although maybe thank you very much OpenSSL, your delays have made us improve <laughs> some other things. So. <laughs> like clockwork. Yes. <laughs> so this is a good one. Uh, if anyone has nothing more on this part, maybe we can move to... I what? have one more. Yes, sir. Well, Jamie, uh, did you sketch out the jail descriptor API you are looking to implement? Uh, yeah, the API is mostly in just in uh, adding a descriptor parameter to jail get and jail set. So if you create a jail and add a descriptor parameter that will re return a jail descriptor when you create mm -hmm. the jail and okay. And and likewise with jail, with jail git, you can. Uh, it's it's actually a a bidirectional thing. If you give a valid descriptor in that parameter, it will use that instead of a jail ID. If you have a parameter without a descriptor number in it, then it will return a descriptor. Um, so it it doesn't change the actual system call. It's just all in the parameters. Okay, but the operations on the descriptors because. What yeah. is if you if you then run jail set, if you call jail set and you know you can call it without a J I jail ID, but with a descriptor, it will use the jail pointed to by that descriptor. Okay. Um I was more thinking about the really the system call level, not the uh, C API level. Yeah, uh, the system because... call level it for jail get and jail set, it does not change at all. For jail attach and jail remove, there would be a new JD attach and JD remove calls that take a descriptor instead of a JID. Uh, but it still has to be unique. So it, just because uh, there is a, you have a jail descriptor in file descriptor number four, shouldn't mean that you can no longer address jail ID four, right? So the oh um, yeah, it's, I mean the the somewhere. file descriptor number is just per process namespace. The only thing that number is used for is just getting the descriptor itself, and then that just points straight to the jail so, without worrying about jail ID. But unless you're adding either a new uh, system call or modifying the existing system call in such a way that there is a basically a type bit telling it whether it references a jail ID or a file descriptor, you get an um, aliasing problem. It, well, yeah, it, with the jail getting set, the parameter would be either JID or desk. And with um, attach and remove, it's a separate system call. So that's yeah. what tells you which kind you're using. Question. Okay. Yes. Um, I, I, I just realized I don't know anything about operating system kernels. Wait, if I print the jail descriptor, wouldn't I get a GID technically? Um, no, the jail descriptor is... You know, it's, it's just like a, a file descriptor memory. in that no. the descriptor number doesn't matter except for finding Ooh. the file it refers to. Okay. Here, the descriptor matter doesn't number except for finding the jail it refers to. And the fact yeah. that the jail has a numeric ID is completely coincidental to how the descriptor is used. Got it, got it, got it. So, so, so if I do print the jail descriptor, I would get... The jail descriptor from user space. You, yes. you have to be very pedantic because yeah. there is the jail descriptor is the struct allocated in the kernel yeah okay. and from user what space it's just a number is a, okay is, now i got it it's okay. a fi file descriptor number yeah, yeah, yeah which is an index into your processes table of it's file self. descriptors yes yes, yes. So, I, at the kernel level it's a pointer but the pointers are referenced via an array from yep. user space. You have an interaction yep. there. Here, here's a, here's a, here's a, here's a, here's a, a question for no same reason. Uh, if if someone enabled ProtzFS on FreeBSD, because we can do enabled that what? If we enabled ProtzFS, pro, 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 ProcFS. It's called yes. the processor. Why do we call it ProcFS? You know, uh, if we enabled pro, ProtzFS, 
procfs and you go like on on linux when you go to slash proc slash the pid and then slash fd and do ls you will mm -hmm. see a pointer that you know a symbolic links to all the sockets right so if we yeah. enable mm -hmm. that on freebsd will we see like fd number 14 that points to instead of socket it will say you know uh j1 or something like that does that even make sense it Did would that... it would just show that it is a file descriptor i don't i don't i don't know how uh process descriptors already it would do the same thing that process descriptors do whatever okay. that is okay okay got it. Um, got it. most sockets are also outside of the file system namespace and can't point to anything seen you may, if it's a sum link, you can basically put a random string in there and it's a broken sum link at that point. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So for example, for a IPE socket or for a TCP over IPv4 socket, you put, could serialize in some way the relevant header fields the socket is bound to and then, then you put it in a sum link and you get a broken sum link or you could go the extreme way like plan nine did and mm -hmm. basically make sockets a special kind of um a file and then or well such that there is a path for a mm -hmm. certain tcp connection in a dynamic file system but that's not what unix normally did and the other thing is that um you can already, without procfs, get it the file descriptors of a process via ptrace for debuggers. Yes. And that way, in theory, yes, you could take, basically, if you are running at the same user or a super user, you can either inject or copy slash steal uh, descriptors from a process. Of course. But but that, that's a good question because most implementations on almost every other operating system is uh, Rogers ProcFS, right? And Rogers ProcFS, which came from SVR4 and then went into Solaris and then Linux copied some things from that. So, you know, most of them look like Rogers uh, ProcFS. And there's an awesome talk from Systems We Love on that topic. So, uh, but FreeBSD's ProcFS implementation is kind of different. For example, uh, in, in most procfs's, there is a directory called fd where you know you can see mm -hmm. the, the the open file descriptors. But but FreeBSD's this procfs doesn't have that. For example, I just mounted a procfs on on on, yeah. on. It has a separate file system for that for some reason. Wow, really? Um, the fdeskfs does something different. <laughs> fdeskfs, okay. Uh, what it does is it um, basically it's an alias to embed the file descriptor namespace, normally accessed via explicit system calls like dup into the path namespace. So basically, you have uh, under slash dev fd yes. index, you have yes. a file, and if you open it, you get a new file, and it's just as if you called dup on the Got old it. file. Got it. Okay. Okay. I'm, I'm uh, learning which is new useful things. useful because you can use it as in shell scripts to uh, with commands which expect the path, but you really want to hand them a file descriptor. So basically, cool. having application which don't have any special purpose handling for standard in and out, be able to open a file uh, which is really the the pipe you connected to them. So basically, things like This works, yep. so mount, yep. even, okay, mount has a special handling if you put in a dash, but even if it didn't, you could use it like that. Okay. I am trying to, okay, got it, got it, got it. So, okay, that, well, that does sound interesting. Uh, the question about what the GL descriptor looks like ended up into this. Okay. Because uh, uh, what I'm looking for is with this descriptor, basically, do I still need to be super user to uh, create a new jail with a descriptor? Or can anyone now create a jail? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. At least one with, with no VNet. 
Yes, that's a good point. So th that was one of the other questions that I had for today. Okay. And the other thing is, can I get notifications about um, jail state changes, like someone attaching to it, the jail dying, and so on? We have a file descriptor through K event without polling for it. Mm -hmm. That is the plan. That is part that has not been at all coded yet. Yeah. So, the so, previous so, question about creating jails, I have nothing right now that allows unprivileged creation of jails because a jail descriptor is only for an existing jail already. So mm -hmm. they allow for unprivileged get, set, attach, whatever on a jail, but creation is not really part of that yet. I have to, I'd have to figure out a way to uh, allow that and control it. It's probably already enough to worry about without widening the attack surface. So basically, un unprivileged jail creation is a its own can of worms. Yes. So I, I, I'm, but, I'm trying, I'm, and I'm so sorry. I am trying to get this. So, so because because it, it kind of also relates to your next question, Jan, which is have you have you looked at how Solaris doors are implemented, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera? So, so I was I was talking with my mentor today, and we we were trying to implement the uh, the as you guys remember a couple of weeks ago. We were talking about this implementation that was in our mind, which was how would a supervised jail process tree look like, which was the conversation that we had here. You remember, we, we thought about having yeah. JLD with a Unix socket, et cetera, et cetera. So we were trying to implement this in Oberon, and we do have like a basic prototype kind of thing. And one of the ideas that I had is uh, using sockets, Unix sockets. So for example, there would be var run uh, jailer D, Sorry, we're using JLRD mm -hmm. here. JLRD, but how would you allow a regular user to control jails? And my, uh, you know, dumb idea was okay. So JLD is writable. The socket is writable, mm -hmm. but and by anyone who is part of group jailer, right? So if you're part of group no. jailer, you can write there. And if you're writing there, the demon is reading. If the demon is reading, the demon is executing. Is executing. Obviously, that's not an unprivileged jail, right? That's that's just the, the user is talking with an application that's running as root. So why am I asking this? What I'm asking is, what's the actual benefit of a user being able to run a jail other than the, that you don't have to provide root access? Um, the advantage is that this level of sandboxing, which jail provides, become available to unprivileged applications. For example, let's say you're writing a new browser from scratch because okay. you've just been given $20 million in five years uh, sure. of additional lifetime. <laughs> uh, but now you could have a jail for each origin. Dungeons and computers, okay. <laughs> with each uh, web origin, it's cookies and so on in a well-known location in a state file and so on. So what you're talking about is not that we use the jail command to run separate operating systems, you know, but mm -hmm. rather than a single binary that is being jailed by a user. That's the use case in that. Um, another use case would be just putting things which can't be done in Capsicum because they involve lots of cooperating processes. Mm -hmm. running right now in some, some complex shell script mm -hmm. all at the same security level as the whole user account. But basically with unprivileged users, a non-good user could set up a contained environment mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to run some untrusted code in maybe only with networking disabled or inherited, but that would be enough to have basically run this script with no IP stack mm -hmm. without having to become root, create a new temporary user for it and so on. Mm -hmm. Or at that point, probably creating a full jail. Mm -hmm. um, every time basically you have to potentially run some sub-user land. Mm -hmm. 
Got it. Now I got it. So, okay. So th there are But, uh, use but cases. I think part of your confusion from the way you phrased your question is that the, you, in your mental model, the jail command, mm -hmm. the API, and the kernel aren't separated. Mm -hmm. The jail command is just the canonical way of calling to the C library lib jail, which then invokes the system calls implemented by the run. So anyone with the right privileges and the knowledge how to do it can invoke the system calls. libjail is a helper library to make it easier. And the jail command is just what everyone uses because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's there and it's easy to get started. But as long as you can call C code, you can make use of, of libjail to have a more structured way of interfacing with the jail subsystem. So in the design with the jailer daemon, there is no reason why it should invoke the existing jail command if it gets complex enough that just reusing this code isn't a big advantage anymore. And regarding how you would design it, what I would recommend is having a in your varun uh, jlrd have a subdirectory for each jail and put the socket in there. Why? Because then you can use permissions on mm -hmm. the directory or the directory. Okay. On the directory to um, apply potentially complex ACLs if you wanted to. And something else to watch out for is that a well-written uh, Unix socket server can have the kernel report the effective user and group ID of the client process. Right, right, right. So, right. which is, for example, what Postgres supports, where you can basically uh, uh, get rid of all passwords for Postgres if you run on the same kernel, mm -hmm. even across jails, because you can just have basically a mapping from user ID back to name and then to Postgres wall. And it, it's a really elegant setup. There are a few other demons which supported that well, but it's there. It's not much code. It's just underutilized. Mm -hmm. But it's not like Capsicum where it requires a huge commitment. It's just a few lines... 20, 30 lines of C to add to your daemon. Got it, got it. Okay, that, that does sound interesting. So for example, you could have the JLID's configuration, even say something like this group or these users are allowed to create, to basically to, to instantiate this jail template or something, if you have some kind of instantiation concept there. Okay, so so that that's actually a good idea as well. That's actually a good a good, good, good uh, the directory model is a good idea as well. Uh, and sorry, wh why were you asking about this Solaris door? Um, Do you think we should have? If a... you go a bit up um, further on the chat, where I will link to the right thing, Do doors are different from other file descriptors in that you can create them anonymously, bind them into the. Uh, so basically there can exist, similar to a pipe, there are mm -hmm. uh, named and unnamed pipes, so there are named and unnamed doors. And you can pass oh. them around as file descriptors, but you can also bind them into the file system path. And yeah. Nice, so okay. To make them accessible to an unrelated process to basically get your initial connection. Do, do, do any idea if, this, if the Alumos based operating systems use this? They still use it a lot. Okay. Um, but under the hood, uh, and a lot of places where other operating systems would use Unix sockets, uh, Solaris based ones use DOS, and it's often just an implementation detail. DOS can do a few things a bit cleaner than Unix sockets, but or potentially a bit more efficient. But other than that,
it door or doors? It's door. Okay. Door. Door create. Okay. One of the problems with the door design is that because it comes from a Sun Research project and was then integrated into Solaris, is mm -hmm. that it's heavily designed around multi-threading the idea because and why it's so hard to port to another operating system as is, is that basically the callee thread, so the thread which wants to invoke a service through a door, mm -hmm. gets moved into the server process. So a thread migrates from one process into the other, takes a subset of its address space and descriptors with it, uh, runs there and is then moved back, which can avoid the cost of basically yielding to the server thread and context switching. But it's such a invasive thing to do to basically add the whole idea that a thread can move between processes. And we don't have anything like door in FreeBSD, right? No, we don't, but we have Unix sockets, which can, which every Unix-like operating system should have. And we can and use that to this, this almost does almost all of this, just not as elegant. Not, and this does raise some questions if any other operating systems have something similar. As far as I know, no. As far as you know, no. Unless okay. you count Mac ports, which are, which at least can do the send address space and an array of file descriptors. But what what ports? Uh, the what macOS has inherited. Oh, from Ma, the okay, Ma, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mach oh. microkernel. Yes, but it's uh, not regarded as a very successful design for a microkernel. That's fascinating. Okay, okay. Do you think we should implement doors or doors like API? Um, would it be useful? It would be a to totally a project of its own, and mm -hmm. I would like to see it happen, but I don't think it's a it's worth it. Okay. Okay. Anyone has any ideas on this? I, I've never touched doors. I mean, I I, I haven't either. Okay. Okay. Okay, maybe we should we should ask our Solaris friends and sorry, not Solaris, our, our Illumos <laughs> friends to join us and maybe show us some things that they do with that. Okay. Um, the thing is yeah. that you can basically emulate them with Unix sockets. So, so your idea here that if it was around jails is that we would have a Unix socket inside of a NullFS mount. No. No. This is unrelated. Okay. The thing is, for a jail management demon. Okay. One, oh. Using the jail uh, descriptors to monitor a running jail over its whole lifetime or even a bit longer, basically from the from its conception to a burial, the whole lifetime of a jail, from running the prepare hooks to any tear down and clean up where the jail demon is expected to outlive and proceed the whole jail lifetime. In this design, a jail descriptor is very useful because it avoids a lot of race conditions and is a way to get the events into the jail demon without having it pull something or use the uh, def CTL device, which is only available in a in the host, so it doesn't nest with sub jails and is only available to one daemon at a time. So basically, you would have to have dev d forward the relevant messages or something. And instead of new file descriptor type is the elegant design for it. Okay, that that does sound interesting. But if you okay. have such a daemon, you may want to control it. If you have mm -hmm. a jail D, you want to have a jail C mm -hmm, mm -hmm, client mm -hmm. to the jail mm -hmm, daemon mm -hmm. um, to control it and have it stop a jail on your behalf. And this connection then would be done by an unprivileged process mm -hmm. if it has the permission to connect to the socket. And even after it has a connection to the socket, the server can look up uh, some kind of uh, information about it. For example, it's 
user ID and uh, group ID using additional system calls on the server side to find out, okay, you have a connection, but even if you're connected, what are you allowed to do over the connection? So you could have a very fine granularity uh, there for access control, but it gets very annoying to deal with. Uh, if you're looking for Unix socket, you want to uh, look for the Unix for main page. Unix for man. Or two, maybe, but. Unix domain Unix protocol four. family, yes. Yes. Length family path, okay. Yeah. Um... Okay, that's so worth your. The, the, the short Folks, description would be... I just wanted be... to let you know I need to leave my uh, dollar job. I have a meeting coming up. Um, sure. Sounds good. Okay. Uh, John, any questions? Anything we can help out with? And John is gone, I guess. No, okay. I was just being a fly on the wall today. I appreciate your uh, your your time and efforts doing this. So. Thank you, sirs. Thank you, John. Have a nice day. So, so, so we we could say that Solaris Doors is kind of like you know Unix socket plus plus, in the sense that the, you know, yeah, it's more it's potentially a bit more CPU cycle efficient and mm -hmm. provides a nicer API by default. Mm -hmm. But you can re-implement the functionality mm -hmm. using other things. Common Unix systems, including FreeBSD, have grown over the years. Got it. Got it. I, I, do, I do wonder if, and again, this is me being the noob in here. So I, I, mm -hmm. I keep thinking like, like, okay, we have the Unix man page for the Unix protocol family, mm -hmm. and you would use it using, you know, connect and not listen. No, I just connect. Uh, you will, you just listen. Uh, so, so uh, we don't have examples in here. Is that because they're old? Because like, if you look into no. any other man page, right? There are always examples. No, not... they are not. Yeah. Should should we add examples? Like, like if you look no. into the here, I'm not sure that this one has it. No, I, I'm pretty sure that the GL man page. I does think have we shouldn't examples. add them there because uh, this is a man page, not an introduction to socket programming. There are lots of books written on the topic pick up a common book on Unix uh, socket programming or BSD socket programming. You're right. With the, the old Stevenson or something. And it's standardized. It's part of POSIX. It's, it won't change and it hasn't changed in an incompatible way in a long time. OK. And 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 the, what's the socket pair? This is a and this is a special pair. purpose system call mm -hmm. to create a already connected pair of sockets, similar oh. to a pipe. Okay. So, so okay. if you are you familiar with a pipe system yes. call and libc yes. function? Okay. So there you get a pipe, but a pipe is not on FreeBSD, but normally the standardized part of a pipe is uh, unidirectional. So you have right. a read end and a write end. A socket is bidirectional normally. Nice. Okay. This is awesome. Okay. And normally you have to bind a port and so on. And you have to, if you wanted to have a connected TCP socket, you would have to bind a socket, um, listen on it, accept, uh, create a new socket, connect to it, accept the connection, then you get the connected one. With socket pair, you can immediately create a, two sockets which are connected. And this is one of the ways you can get a Unix socket which does not go through the file system namespace. Basically, give me a connected pair of Unix stream or sequential packet sockets. And that's how you would communicate generally across jails is you would create a socket pair and then you no. have one of the two sockets go to a uh, sub process that gets jail attached and it can still talk to the server that way. Yeah, that's one way of doing it. The other way is to put a listening socket 
So a bound yeah. socket uh, in an LFS mount or directly bind into the jail. So. I, I was trying to see if and if if there is a use of uh, Illumos. Yeah, you if, would probably look for something like door call or F call or something. Yeah. I don't know. No, it's, 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 it's door create. It is door create. That's the creation, but it's often wrapped somewhere. Uh, oh, I got your point. In some higher level API. And, 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 and apparently GitHub is now asking you to log in in order to search inside of a code. Just FYI, gentlemen. So, okay. Mm, that, maybe that... after you have reached a certain rate limit. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And there's also door server create, which, okay. Okay. That, this is good to know. This is good to know. Um, Do you remember correctly, the, for example, use it for the name service caching daemon? Name service caching daemon. Caching UID to name lookups or group to group ID lookups. Okay. Um, anyone else on the Solaris doors? This is very new to me, but uh, Jan, it's but, a good, good thing that you did point. We, we did talk about this once before, right? I think so. Yeah. But really, I wouldn't spend too much time um, to, trying to uh, play with it in a virtual machine or something. Just, it's a good idea to basically think about what kind of workflow do you want to support? Basically, how should the system call sequence the relevant part of it look in your API. Mm -hmm. What is each process expected to do in which order to accomplish some task? Okay. okay. Without all the boilerplate, just basically how would you go about finding in a, your event loop in your jail daemon, what's required that your jail daemon doesn't have to pull and gets reliable notifications about all jail related events like someone has attached or detached from it mm -hmm. oh you can't detach that yeah, yeah. but uh, someone has attached to your jail a jail property has been changed uh, the jail state has changed St stuff like this right and, and and jamie when someone does like j exec right it's basically j exec is executing fork and then jail attach right yeah it's it's very okay got it Okay, got it. Um, related to release engineering, and this I think Michael. No, it's the other way around, right? So you first attach and then you exec. First you attach, then you. Yes, first you attach, then first you fork the jail exec, I guess. And then you. Okay, but that's attach. before mm -hmm. jail, J exec happens. So basically, you fork an exec into J exec, it J attaches, potentially changes the user ID, then it attaches to the jail, potentially changes the user ID again, and then it does a thing and XX into the command you specified. Okay. So uh, related, and I have a question about that as well. Uh, related to mm -hmm. release engineering, uh, Glenn is looking for uh, fundraising, I guess. Yeah, so, uh, mm -hmm. so independent fundraising. Um, she's been doing the uh, uh, engineering since 2013, 10 years actually. Okay, so this is short in here. Whoever would like to uh, hop in and jump, so please do take your time and your money. So yeah, <laughs> that's that's for Glenn. Thank you, Glenn, for 10 years of work. Um, okay, uh, we have a question here. Is the whoever asked the question? Are they here, or Michael added this and then left? I guess. Yeah. Um, the thing is that there was an accidental uh, change. Yeah, and it was backed out quickly, so it wasn't intentional. That this the fix for this problem basically created some fallout, and that's all. I see. I see, and this has been fixed apparently. Yes, it has already been fixed. It has just cost me some time. Okay, preventing me okay. from working on other things. <laughs> Did did you did you add this? No, but it it did affect you. Yes. Okay, got it. Okay, thank you. I run a, a daily cron job rebuilding all my uh, package repos every night on a big um, jail host, and because of that, I hit the few hour long window 
where this was relevant and then finished building a package repository with a signature which wasn't considered valid by any of my existing user lands. So mm -hmm. they could no longer package update and upgrade and install from this repository. Mm -hmm. So let's see, um, let's see what else. So um, here we do have a question from Michael, which was, can one pin CPU cores to Nix and you pointed to uh, Net ISR, which, mm -hmm. but this is a- This, is the, this isn't the best uh, do, po thing to point to because this yeah. is the kernel- uh, Level implementation. API uh, yeah. inside the kernel. It's not how you would configure it, but yeah, yeah. So, so it would be done by this interface. Maybe we need like a. The uh, question is, uh, how do, you, where does this packet dispatching happen, right. in which thread context? So, right. does it run on the on a pin thread on each CPU, or is there a thread pool which is smaller than the number of CPUs which just floats around to as a normal scheduled person says inside the kernel or um, do you which used to be a configuration like 15 years ago for lower end systems or very high packet end systems where you would basically pull the network card a few thousand times a second mm -hmm. and disable interrupts Mm -hmm. so that you get some batching effect on the load, but always burn a lot of CPU. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Okay. There are a few possible configurations there. Yeah. So let's see what else we have here. This is a broader question, but before I go into that long one, uh, there was a broader question here mentioning Jamie, and since Jamie is here, uh, as Jamie is discovering what popular web client applications work out of the box on FreeBSD, such as Zoom, Slack, Web, Skype. Uh, uh, yeah, that that just that question just came up because I've been trying to just get Zoom to work well on Windows, what you think would be the easiest thing in the world. Wow. So I didn't actually ask that question about free FBSD. It just kind of brought it up. Okay. Michael okay. actually uh, was, was wondering about that. So maybe okay. something to actually ask when he's here. <laughs> That's a good question. Like, I, I think you have a valid point here. Maybe maybe the FreeBSD test suite should also have like GUI oriented tests as well. Like I understand that the scope of the project for all this time has been, you know, uh, from the CI CD pipeline perspective, right? We've, we've been, you know, building the port story, okay? Both uh, as a you know separate thing to know if something fails and then email the maintainers, that's one. And then that becomes the package tree that people can download. Great. We also have the free BSD uh, source tree that gets compiled, I guess, every time that we make a push technically to Fabricator. That's why a demon out there starts shouting that this has been built properly. Because I, I keep seeing that in Fabricator as far as I can tell, right? So whenever you push something, Herald comes and says that this has been compiled properly or something like that. I never understood what that is, which I don't see here for some reason, except here that Herald says added a subscriber. So for example, because I've seen that in my uh, changes, like let's say, uh, actually it would be easier to go to an account, right? Than actually try to find something. Okay, sure, this one. So like a bot would come up. No, I don't see it here as well. Oh, there we go. Harbor master completed build, blah, blah, blah. So now Harbor master has done a build. I, I actually don't know what this is. So I'm assuming this is like building free BSD and then making sure that it was buildable and it didn't, you know, destroy the whole system, technically speaking, I guess. Basically they make build work, build kernel. With that diff and make sure that it built fine. Okay. So it does that. Okay, great. And uh, we also have, what's our CI CD pipeline? CI.freebsd.org? Yeah. Which is our Jenkins. And this is doing the doc main, doc offline docs, also docs, apparently a lot of docs. And then main something, something. And okay, this is doing everything on FreeBSD, but we're not testing actual usage of applications. So like a good point here would be, now, taking FreeBSD, booting it up, installing the packages, Xorg, what have you, 
opening a browser, going to a Slack and then making sure you're logging fine or going to Zoom and making sure, sure you can do a call. And I mean, there are, there are GUI automation tools on top of Xorg. I'm not sure about Wayland. Wayland is still very far behind that, that can do that, right? Maybe, does that make sense to actually add? I mean, this is also a good place to use jails. Bless ourselves. That's, uh, yes, but that's a giant project of its own. I know, but like, is it is it even worth it? Because I mean, it's it's tests. I, I feel like tests are always worth it. Yeah. Um, while I feel like tests are always worth it, my actions have not backed that up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I know the feeling. I know the feeling. Last time I wrote a test, one was I was learning about tests. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay uh okay everyone has a test system the lucky ones have separate production systems <laughs> so 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 the, so this is a good one so we don't test such things maybe we should point this out to the community as a whole and this mm -hmm. also can start as a separate project you know like I can just fire up a, a, a bare metal server, a tiny one on the cloud, and just have a free BSD VM that does all of that automated and see what it does. And the, the, the hard part is going to be like, how can you make sure that the microphone is working? You know, it's I, I feel that that's going to be the hard part. It's the really actual application hardware. and operating system testing. Yeah, exactly. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it's not that hard, right? Like if 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 dev audio zero or dev video zero is working fine, then we can say But that what about, point. let's say, if you really want to get into the weeds, let's say someone changes the implementation of the uh, volume mixer inside the kernel, and now you want to see if it has degraded the audio quality. So uh, at that point, you no longer just have to see, but you will have to basically capture the produced or recorded waveforms and compare them against some oh, yeah. fitness so, function. Uh, so that, that, case, that, that's, um, why, that's why you're saying it's a massive work, right? Like we have to capture the audio from the operating system of what the application is doing. And or, um, you have it. to have a blessed configuration of stuff where you have really, really someone, let's see, you say you want to test if OpenGL acceleration works. Open GL acceleration. Video what? acceleration. Okay. Okay. And you do it and the tests run to completion. Fine, but on the you only see garbage on the screen. Because maybe the screen wasn't initialized correctly or <laughs> not at all. <laughs> but the frame buffer contained the right content. So and now even if you take a screenshot, the screenshot is correct. But the output on a on an HDMI display would be uh, garbled. Yeah, this is something yeah. which yeah, has such end-to-end -end testing is valuable, but but very hard. It's to really a, it's a full-time job and requires a big hardware lab. Right, 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 right. Okay, yeah. Well, maybe, maybe uh, still, I do think that it's it's a good point that as Jamie was discovering that we should actually point this out to maybe the foundation. You know, like. Can we have extra hardware to the, try to build a proof of concept of something like this? And I feel that um, you know, Zoom would be a good one because a lot of people use it these days. Or even Skype is also a good one, you know? So yeah, doing applications. Something else, uh, which would be a lot smaller in scope would be to make sure that when adding the features we've been talking about the last few weeks, yeah. uh, there are not just positive tests, but also negative tests. Yes. So make sure that the permissions actually restrict you. Yes. But make sure things fail as expected. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I am not aware of that. Let's go and check cgit.freebsd. Or do we have tests for the jail application? Source, <laughs> uh, it's in the user SPIN, right? Yep. Jail. If we do, I didn't write them. <laughs> there are tests. Okay. Uh, commands dot. This is a. This uh, is just, a yeah, okay. just running the RC system. Sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. And this one is. Oh, okay. We have a we have a, a QA test, as they call it. So you know, check exit, ignore stuff, ignore. It's, I I have no idea what this does. By the way, I'm not familiar with with. with Make ATF. sure that some basic sanity checks uh, pass, and that you can create a persistent jail. 
children max, et cetera, et cetera, ETF. Oh, so I mean, there, there, are, there, there is some good amount of tests where maybe we should go over this. And if we do run git log on this file, it was when? 2019? No, just a couple of, no, this is just the identifier, 2021. And yeah, this is a header, and then it was written in 2019. Okay, yeah, there's, there's a good one. Maybe we should go over this test as well. I think this would be very interesting. I, I'm trying to learn uh, QA, so QA, however you want to call it. Uh, so th this might be a good place to actually learn it as well. And th this is good. This is good. It's it's good that we have something. And I do wonder if uh, J Exec has that. Nope, no testing J Exec. Although there is not much to test in there. And then we have JLS, also not much trust in here, but it would be a good idea to make sure like the output is fine. For example, I think that's a good one, right? To make sure that the output is fine. Yes, yeah, so the, the um, output from it and isn't changed. For example, if someone were to add libxo support and we produce exactly. the existing output format as is. Exactly, exactly. To minimize the risk of breaking someone's existing script. Which which does give uh, does give me a question. So I was I was playing around with a jailer uh, to, to make the new version. And I, I had this question, which is in our, I think it's in jailer core. Yes. So I, I do tend to use uh, libexo whenever possible. For example, in here, as you can see, like exo mm -hmm. and it prints as needed, which which gives me the ability to you know pass the style if I need to. But... I was thinking, do we, is there any shell application out there that always uses um, XO? Because if you look into our why? Process, we also have a printf. And I would want I to- I think like, there's a problem in your script. Go on. Uh, um, you're using uh, the dash Z and then an unquoted uh, variable expansion. Yes, but regardless of that, you have no idea how, the, how many bugs are here like that. The problem is that this gets split into multiple tokens. Yeah. And the the some of the sub tokens could be uh, things like operators for the test. Mm. If mm. you want, really want to be sure, you have to put it in double quotes. Yeah, but 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 so. but, but a, a question here would be like, um, is, is there a shell application that uses EXO like you know ex exclusively? Like I like if I if I look into my code base. Printf, printf, mm -hmm. let's go to a better one, right? So here it would printf something like, you know, starting jail, right? So here it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's starting jail. Maybe this should also be changed into exo and always pass the dash exo parameters in the shell, just like we do on the command application, right? Less or so. So that, that might be interesting because I, I haven't seen a shell application that uses libexo right, like that or exo like that. So uh, maybe- no, but it's a good idea. Yeah, like have the downside is that it's forward. always a sub command. It's always so it's forking a lot. That's that's what you mean. Not just forking; it's also leaking all the arguments uh, as an argument vector. So let's say you mean. want to print a, a password back, right? Or an encryption Why? key. Why would you want to print that? People do that. As an example, let's say oh, I'm okay. configuring a WireGuard interface yeah. and I want to print out for as debug output so we, the whole configuration, including the private key. Let's, let's do try that. The debug right? log. I do wonder. I if... wouldn't want this to show up in the um, as process argument where anyone may inspect it. Right. I wonder if, uh, if it's pipeable. Shell built-ins aren't uh, vulnerable to this, like things like echo and printf, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because in FreeBSD bin sh printf as a built-in, so it doesn't get forked in exact, mm -hmm, unless mm -hmm. you prefix it with a command. And as far as I can tell, uh, the exo command itself doesn't support like reading from pipes, you know, so you could pipe stuff uh, into it. No, um, nope, it, it doesn't, unfortunately. Okay, I get your point. I get your point. Somehow we ended and, up talking about it. But the about other problem is that it uh, will fork this program a lot. Yeah, yeah. I'm okay with that. I'm, I'm pretty okay with that. So, yeah. 
Um, uh, 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 here someone wrote, share your favorite D-Tracer script. I was going to share one, uh, which I wrote like last week, but if not, uh, we can talk about, someone wrote this. I don't know who wrote this, but it's, it's a very long and broader question. Uh, which one do we want to get into? Does anyone have any, uh, you know, uh, specific needs? Now that disk space is not as limited as it was. The, okay, this is a long question. Oh, maybe I should just get my glasses, you know. Uh, now that disk space is not as limited as it was, once was, how can FreeBSD better archive its net media binaries and build artifacts for a seamless transition from EOL to re hashtag retro computing? Okay, this is Michael. Uh, DVD ISOs would have been very helpful to placing down a libc slash sumbar regression several years ago. Once those binaries are gone, they are gone. Links to Torgz's Tor, let's just call them Torgnu zips uh, in mm -hmm. the port. Uh, in the ports are likely broken. This is a broader issue in open source. Plus, rebuilding history is awesome when recapping your Amiga, but sucks when rebuilding a download directory that would have simply been moved to an archive area. Perhaps, uh, perhaps perform a smoke test audit of what TJZ downloads are available, say from the 10 era. So, okay, I, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna point out something. Uh, Vince from our free BSD community has actually started a awesome YouTube channel. Uh, I don't know what YouTube is gonna show here, by the way. Maybe it shows whatever Armenians are watching. Yeah, that makes sense. And it was called, it was called Circuit. Is that how we write Circuit? Rewind. So yeah, Vince started the YouTube channel about this. And one of the points that he was talking about is like, if you go and try to download, if you boot FreeBSD 5 and you try to download the post tree or the post tree that came with, you know, the post.tarball for FreeBSD <sighs> And you build Nano, it will not build because, you know, because um, apparently, the, yeah, the, 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 the file has moved. The file has moved. Yes. The, the location of the file has moved. So that's actually another good point. Like even if we like, should we keep that you know, seventy gigabytes of archive somewhere, or or should we? I mean, there's a lot of we ifs. The uh, problem I, that's is the value in here, by the way. The problem is if you keep every built artifact, we are talking about not gigabytes, but tens and hundreds of terabytes. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, for a single version, it's, it's like it's like hundred gig. Mm -hmm. yeah. So um, you could at least keep the disk, pull in the disk files, but for some you're not even allowed to. Really? So it has to be yeah License for some issues? ports, some ports reference. Uh, in the extreme things are things like create two ports where basically make the maps available in this directory and then build the port. Fascinating. Okay. Basically the, the tech to look out for, I think is restricted and then the label for the restriction. Okay. Um, or so, something it used to be for the official Java runtime where you basically had to download it yourself, click the I agree, and then yep. you had to drop in the disk file. Yep. In name uh, restrictions like this. Okay, that, that means, but that's not all the ports, like that's the minority of the ports. Yes. You know? So the, 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 even the then idea... you have all of the potential problems with. Uh, reproducing exact builds of like uh, FreeBSD snapshots where okay. you get maybe some really old versions weren't um, reproducible builds. Then even with reproducible builds, it kind of matters uh, what's your host system. At least for some things, unless you do a double rebuild and stuff, yeah. So, so like, so, so you, like, if, if I take, if I take like FreeBSD thirteen point whatever now it is for thirteen point mm -hmm. two, and I check out and I check out the five point four uh, tag, uh, and mm -hmm. I do make, I assume it's not going to compile properly, right? Well, the base system probably will compile. Oh. 
Oh, but the thing is, is it really what was on the ISO back in the day? If you build the old system with a new compiler, oh. um, if you bootstrap the old compiler using a new compiler, yeah, maybe there's some undefined behavior in the old 20-year-old C compiler code. Maybe point. you will have a miscompilation because a new compiler does some optimization which was so far ahead of what compilers did at the time that basically nobody cared about relying on implementation specific or even undefined behavior. Yep. And so basically really make this one of the points is that let's say you're offering paid support and a customer comes to you with, well, I have this FreeBSD 7 box in there and it's really mission critical and no one dares go near it. Okay. How do we move forward? And basically you have to recreate this environment. Okay. If you can't do that, things get tricky. Okay, got your Especially point. if someone, or crazier things, if someone kept an old uh, major release around by doing manual MFCs of certain bug fixes or features or even drivers. Mm -hmm. This has happened multiple times at someone incorporating FreeBSD into a product and then falling behind the development because it looked easier in the beginning and was attempting to just, it works now, uh, we will never have to update it. And then the product, basically, yeah, but what about supporting a new main board when your old board goes out of production? How do you get drivers? Well, oh, fuck, we have to forward port all of our changes. Got it. Okay. It's why uh, Netflix stays so close to uh, current. So mm. that they don't have to do that, but always really contribute back so that the FreeBSD product in turn uh, doesn't diverge from them. And but this requires understanding that you're having a yeah a mutually uh, advantageous relationship over time instead of just consuming something. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, anyone has any ideas on this? Like I I've had problems because I've actually seen FreeBSD seven a couple of days ago, which is not I I don't know. Can we consider FreeBSD seven retro computing? I don't think so. It's not into the retro world yet. Uh, uh, Depends on the hardware it's running on, but <laughs> no, someone is running it on an alpha. No, no, no. It's 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 an on on an x eighty six machine, uh, but it's it's running as a router, and it has been running as a router for like, well, whenever seven came out. So it's I think tw twelve years at this point, yeah. even more, probably even more. It was in twenty ten, so thirteen years. Thirteen years. Uh, let's actually check that en.wikipedia.org and here we have FreeBSD release version history and uh, FreeBSD 7 in, yeah, yeah, makes sense, 2008. I wonder why they did not deploy FreeBSD 8, but anyways, maybe they had an old sysadmin because a lot of old sysadmins are like never deploy the latest version, it might have bugs. They think it's Windows. Uh, so no, uh, it will have unknown bugs. Unknown bugs, it will have unknown bugs, not, yeah. Uh, so okay, that's 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 yeah. I mean, uh, for example, there they needed to deploy a application on the firewall for security purposes. In this case, Radius purposes, and um, it wasn't building. And you know, I have to have a mm -hmm. almost identical environment, but I can't because uh, how the hell am I going to get FreeBSD seven? And apparently, you know, we In don't have it. Yeah, obviously, but like you can't go to downloads.freebsd.org and download you know, freebsd. I think it's ftp.freebsd.org. There you go. And then download the that, that or can we? I don't know. Releases. I want to say ISO images. Yeah, you can't. Only, only no, the last. You have to go to the archive. Oh, we have something like that? Where the hell is that? It's on the... Pop FreeBSD archive and it's one up. No, Pop. it's on FTP archive. 
So ftp.freebsd.org slash archive. I think it's this, it should be this URL if I remember correctly. Yeah. FTP free BSD archive. And it's on ftparchive.freebsd.org. ftparchive.freebsd.org. Let's see what we have in here. FreeBSD archive. And yeah, you're right. Thank you. Old releases. Let's say ISO images. Okay, it's it's just back to nine. That's that's not an archive. Just that's just you take know. a look at the link. What do you mean? The latest one. <laughs> so cool. it wasn't always an ISO. Oh, 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 okay, okay. Go into the uh, X68. Um I-368. I can't see it. There we go. Okay. Okay. Oh, now we're getting and somewhere. Thank you. Let's do it this one way. Do, But the problem is that this is only the official release artifact. Sometimes the updates uh, are problematic to get. You're Even right. getting this running in, a, in an efficient modern hypervisor is problematic because you have to... It won't know... FreeBSD one won't know about VetIO. You have to emulate contemporary common hardware. I never knew about this. We had 5.2.1. We had a two-point system. When did this mm -hmm. happen? Is this is this like uh, common? I think it was look it up in the release notes. It's probably some bug fix. Yeah. Okay. So this is a good one. So apparently we do have these things and I don't know if it's deployable or not, but it's, it's good but, to know. But it's that only the, basically the install media, which is preserved yeah. this way. Yeah. For and releases. For AMD, it goes back to 5.1 for AMD. Yeah, which is maybe the first one to add 64 bit. Four bits, AMD. exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, we'll always look at the link. And... Uh, by any chance, we have older than two. We don't. We don't. We don't mm -hmm. have older than two. Right? What? Yeah. Uh, the uh, first one. The first one? Alpha? No, 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 no. The link I sent you is to the FreeBSD 1.0 release. Oh, okay. Got it. Got the last it. one. Okay. So let's... Uh, sorry, that's not... That's a different window. Copy link. But there we go. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So it's, oh, it is in here. That's weird. I didn't see it. Is it just like not in? It, it's, it sorts before vote 10. So. Oh, it's hidden. Okay. It's like, it's like hidden to the eye, not to the. Yes. Yeah. Okay. This is good. This is good. Horrible. But... And when we have source disk. Oh my God. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Do modern tools even understand this? Well, the ones included do, and you do have install mediums, so you can just use the tools included, right? Read me. But you will um, not find any of the required uh, distribution files for any of the ports, so the dist files will be missing. So I, I do wonder how many, how many of, like. This is like doing internet ar archaeology at this point. We moved from JS yes. to internet archaeology. Uh, technical support for this product is not provided by World Not Creek CD-ROM. Okay, I think that's CD-ROM.com. Uh, you need to contact one of the following companies and or people for technical support, accurate automation company. What happened to them? Uh, Gray Clark the second. Okay, Jordan Hubbard, hi Jordan. <laughs> vector systems okay well this this is actually interesting like we we have very much interesting things in here which is very much fascinating mm -hmm. and uh in the uh in the this is the readme and you would do it with cd install right so here would be cd install i have no idea what if flp that's a floppy file flp probably probably and you would install it. okay yeah there we go and there's an oh so there is a you know basic documentation to get this up and running i wonder if someone has free BSD one running somewhere, but the dot AMTLD, the dot AMTLD was running two point something point something. So uh, I have no idea which one that was, but th th they did have that. So uh, old AMX, I haven't, uh, 
I'm guessing 2.1.5, I'm guessing, is the one that FreeBSD was, uh, the, the .amtld was running. Okay, well, this, this is actually very much interesting. Um, let's, let's, let's do something for Michael for later, and we'll just do like this. Let's copy this. I assume he knows about this, but it's just, this is all what, that's there, as far as I know. This is all we can what's missing have. Is, what's missing is basically someone finding out if we can reassemble what has been archived in such a way that you can, for example, build an X368 uh, X server with, I don't know, KDE2 or something. There you go. So okay. let's say you have to re, you have to, I don't know, compile a Perl 4 or something. Yeah, yeah. Where do you get this and all the ports wrapping crumb and so on for old Perl 5 or something with my 4 and whatever things uh, are best forgotten. So, 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 so another broader question is QA, that's quality assurance, QE, what's QE? Well, I have no idea. Maybe what it should have been QC. Quality check. He doesn't write on Dvorak to mistype, even on Dvorak, he wouldn't mistype seen any. And standards compliance. I, I, I have good questions about this. And if anyone knows, please jump in. Has anyone ever worked on like the POSIX standards or whatever? Because as far as I know, the open group, are we allowed to you know, mm -hmm. open their website when we're going to post this later on YouTube? Uh, the open group, uh, when they do work with other companies for the certifications, like if we go to the... Uh, uh, POSIX certified, whatever it is. I have no idea even how to go there. Certifications, sure. Um, again, there we go, Pos Unix systems, there you go. So even, even if you go to like the certified companies, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, as far as I know, and I, I might be wrong, I just heard about this when talking to other engineers, is that they end up giving the companies like Apple and HP and IBM, like a bunch of a scripts that they would run. And yeah. then the scripts would verify if like this call is POSIX compliant or this po this call is not POSIX compliant, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, if, if the, is anyone aware of this? And uh, is anyone even aware that we if we can have those? We you know, can't. We can't. Those are very expensive. Free, it's a free uh, services never use them. As, as far as I know, it's like twelve hundred dollars. Hmm. I don't know. I, I thought they were they were prohibitive to the point that yeah, you know, just mm, the, maybe it's just not the scripts. Maybe it's just the actual certification that's yes. out of range for oh. anything that's not a megacorp. Okay. Okay. And to say you're a certified Unix to this in this level, yes. For that, you have to pay a regular fee and on mac os may be a certified unix but it doesn't mean a, for example has sequential packet sockets but a lot cause a lot of things are optional mm. that's a good point that is a good point and other things uh, to be fully compliant in some regards, FreeBSD would have to change things in an incompatible way, breaking existing code. Right, because 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 what you're saying is um, we we are not one hundred percent Unix compliant. We we have right like some of our APIs act differently. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Always okay. have been. Always has been. Okay. Um, so, so this is interesting because I, I again I did talk with some engineers and like the, the cost wise they were like no it's like you know, a couple of you no know, couple like it 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 it's definitely not more than five thousand dollars to uh, but so maybe here, for maybe example can... you uh, go to the, this is royalties per unit right but we're not doing any selling because but we still have units you still have units basically oh. you would have to count how many installations or whatever there are and then 
Yeah. Right. 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 Well, that that would be interesting to figure. More like... than so you're in the more than something. Maybe if it's yeah. open ended, then you are in this category. If you can't uh, account for it, unless you can okay. negotiate something else. Right. I, 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 this is actually a good question for me. I would love to, again, I'm just saying from a marketing perspective, which, you know, FreeBSD is not good. From at. a marketing perspective, I think open source has outstripped POSIX and nobody yes. cares if you're POSIX compatible. <laughs> okay. And the thing is... They care if you're Linux compatible. Um, there's a difference between compatible and compliant and okay. certified. Compatible, compliant. Like compatible is what FreeBSD is. Mm -hmm. Com compliant is what FreeBSD is not and certified is what FreeBSD can't be because you know we, we have to pay money okay and you're not a, yeah and they do have the test suites in here I, I don't know if these test suites are like downloadable or not but like they, they do exist in here actually that's a good idea what happens if I click on it would it actually open the test suite oh it, op it opened something Wait, what do I do oh just pricing information immediately into money damn it man okay um, so, uh, I, I don't know if, well, how we got here, right here, compliance. I, but I think the, the person who's asking the question is for other things as well. Like, uh, like would, would even the idea of like HIPAA compliance apply to all printing systems or the idea of like, if those go into application infrastructure, right? Is there anything other than the open group standards that can apply to all printing systems? Well, Not that I'm aware of. Except cryptography, of course. Cryptography uh, being auditable in some way so that, for example, you can get the right HIPAA or GPDR compliance and so on in there. And part, But the thing is that if something, basically it doesn't have to be secure, it only has to be compliant or pass an audit, no? So it's... That, that, I'm a that's bit a good cynical point. on this. Basically, do you want well-designed systems? Do you want checkbox compliance to some list so that some accountant can sleep at night? Or right. do you need it to get through a file review? So credit right. card payment processors would be another example. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and we had uh, talks at UBSDCon on that. I was going to say that. some Baltic uh, provider. The, I think an Italian one. Mm. Moridium? Moridium? Was Mo Liga Modirium. or something? Uh, I, know, I, know, I know that Moridium is. Yes, they they have a lot of compliances and they do use FreeBSD GLs intensively and they also use mm -hmm. the audit framework intensively. And uh, For example, one of the, for the old uh, PCI DSS certification, the root password had to be split into two parts, kept separate by different groups of people and so on, so that no single person could lock in as root. And they, so why would we have a root password? We just disable root. Yeah, exactly, this talk. Yeah. We need to watch. And look back again on this. Uh, because some. What did you say about root? Uh, basically, the, uh, the certification requirements required them to split up the root password into two pieces, which may only be uh, combined once recorded in the audit log or something. And to be used to recover in emergency conditions. And they just said, we don't need it. We have other processes. Even having a root password to split would be a security problem. Yeah. And instead, but for compliance, they had to generate a random one, split it up and burn both pieces. Got it. Got it. Um, I, I don't, I mean, I, I know a lot about compliance and, you know, the security aspect, but like never from an operating system point of view. And uh, I, I think that talk covers almost a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And we've never talked about the audit framework, because as far as I know, until today, the audit framework is not jail aware. Like it doesn't know if this process is running inside the jail or not. As far as I know, I might, I might be wrong. 
Wait, I think it does. I think no. I think he mentioned Doesn't that. Doesn't it they, record for jail ID? I I wait. Or man or that or that D. Um, that's the audit log, correct? Okay, man audit. And that's the thing itself. And what, what about the audit man for? You know what? Maybe I should do it in the browser. So you can't use it inside a jail, but I don't know. .org slash, .org slash audit. And that would be, I'm guessing, in section number So the four. zone name token contains the jail ID or name. The z what, wait, what? Yeah. Bar it's listed under box uh, in the audit for man page. This is part of this is part of this is part of the the BSM subsystem, right? That I think it yes. got out of Sun OS. I think it was some DARPA founded research project, something trusted BSD. Uh, wh where is the uh, uh, wh which man page should I look into for the content of the audit? Auditon. <laughs> um, which okay. fields there are? Here's a good idea. That's just the audit in all sections. Apropos. I have no idea what apropos means in English, by the way. If someone can explain to me like, like I'm five. Just by yeah, yeah. looking for substrings. Trailer. Okay. Okay. The I okay, so here they were expanded address token, address token, IP token, as interesting, path token, path attribute, process token. And does the process token have any jail in nothing in here? Maybe we should do just jail. Oh, there we go. Zone name token. Okay, this definitely came from Sun. <laughs> uh, the zone name token holds an alternated string with the name of the zone or jail which the record originated. A zone name token can be created using the uh, audit to zone name. Okay, zone. Okay, well, this is actually interesting. Yeah. So there, there is there is information about the jail in here. Uh, I don't like this audit framework. I've I've used it. I've used it. I've I've, I've used it. And it was a pain. I would like way too much prefer to, you know, use Dtrace in, for that. There have been some uh, cringe-worthy uh, images about OpenBSM and OpenBDSM. <laughs> uh, I'm not as back as. Um, 2004, okay. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the, the OpenBSM implementation was created by McAfee Research in security division of McAfee Inc. under contract to Apple yeah. Computers. It was sub subsequ subsequently adopted by the Trusted BSD project. Okay, you're right. So it went into the DARPA funded Trusted BSD and it was apparently contracted by Apple. But yes. Good to know. Thank you, Apple. I mean, that, that was done during the time when Jordan Hubbard was the director of the Unix uh, technology yes. division. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, okay. Okay. Well, this is nice. Thank you, Robert Watson, as well. Um, okay. Well, uh, yeah, apparently it, the, the, the compliance-wise, the audit framework does have a lot of information that can be used. But if we mm -hmm. talk about compliance from the other thing... It's, open group, then uh, thank you, Jamie. Apparently the tests are cheap, but uh, the certification is expensive. And you have to pay yeah. them loyalty? Like what the hell? Yeah, that's how these groups exist. It's, it's like academic papers, you know, they take people's work and shave money off of it. Okay. By the way, you're a bit of your English lesson for the day. So apropos is really an obscure word that nobody would use. It basically means pertaining to, in this case, but in Emacs, control H A happened, A happened to be a, a useful word, a useful letter that was not used after control H in Emacs. So they used it for searching help stuff by saying, A, uh, let's, what's a good word that, you know, that we haven't used a letter for yet? And they found apropos. 
I think we're up for Emix. No one would use it in that in that regard. So let's see what Armenians translate this into. Uh, so Armenians translate this into, by the way. This is yeah. by the way. And also... Yeah, that's, that's a different meaning of apropos. Oh, that's there, there is a set phrase, apropos of nothing, meaning, oh, completely unrelated. Okay, okay, okay. It's okay. really, yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's more probably a French word than an English one. Oh, yeah. Like like touche, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, this is this is nice. Uh, anyone wants to share Dtrace scripts? Because I have one. I would love to. I wrote it a couple of weeks ago. Uh, if we have no more topics to discuss about compliance, that is. By the way, Jamie, thank you about the English lesson. I I I I, uh, I, mean, I think uh... in English. Being an Armenian, I think in English. But sometimes I'm like, why? Like English is the JavaScript of human languages, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Everything has been lumped onto there at some point, yeah. Yeah. So the English language evolved just like the uh, English Empire. They came, found a, a bunch of words, hit them with a club, and took them home. Yeah. Oh, well, except <laughs> the early part of the English language, which a bunch of people came onto the British Isles and hit them with clubs and yeah. put their languages on them. <laughs> <laughs> comparing that to like Arabic like Arabic is literally a mathematical language like there is no exceptions there is no like it's just a pure lambda functions in the language you know <laughs> it's 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 no wonder they created math <laughs> so yeah okay well this is interesting um uh, I, I uh let me see I'll, I'll paste my script here and you guys give your ideas about it because I well, wrote this for my company. but I've never done anything with D-Trace, so I'm going to uh, take this opportunity to bow out, I think. Okay, sounds good. So, so what have you done? I have done I have done this. I think you'll love it. Uh, let's see, Courier Neo and paste. So this is what my um, script looks like. Uh, it starts with uh, a, 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 a struct. That it is, an, it is an internal struct. It's called from address port user mm -hmm. address db and success. Uh, let's move mm -hmm. this back into full screen. Okay. Uh, and then I have a struct that is made of it's made of a list of these structs. Mm -hmm. So what I do uh, is this is a script for MariaDB. Mm -hmm. this, this is a script for MariaDB, and it starts with get the peer address. It looks for, and this actually is, because uh, MariaDB, I, I might be wrong, but they actually, like the whole MySQL thing as well, they like they just remove the D-trace from their code base. So I had to use the PIT provider, which means I'm looking into libc functions and the functions yeah. of the applications itself. So this was a if function. It's unmaintained, it, it rots away and gets in the way, all That's the fine. static trace points. Yeah. So, so I started with a thread set peer address function. And the reason why I'm using the, 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 the what do you call this in English? Mm -hmm. The uh, uh, asterisks, because mm -hmm. uh, it's written in C++. Uh, it's in some so places. name mangling. Name mangling, unfortunately. Uh, so, so we start with the, we start with, with, with doing the, uh, what do you call it? With the, uh, uh, we, we get a connection and we, we we use the index as the TID, which is the thread ID, because MariaDB is threaded, unlike Postgres, which is mm -hmm. which is using a, a, a fork model, a child parent model. Yes. So, so here we, we start with, you know, this function gets is address and the port inside here. So I capture those. I set the user on the DB to empty because we will be using it later. Then we go into, uh, and this is so stupid of me to do that, but apparently I can, so I did. Uh, by default, it calls the general log print function. Now, this is only used when you have logging enable, enabled, and by default, it is. So I am using it, mm -hmm. unfortunately. And uh, based on arg1, it uh, this is a pattern matching to realize if what type of log it is, because the, the, the general log mm -hmm. print is used for all of the logs. You know, user logged in, user disconnected, uh, the, the database started replication, blah, blah, blah. So this is the byte value of, 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 of I'm guessing, uh, the user authentication. So based on that, mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm getting the user, the address, the database. Then from ACL, and this was the complicated part, is trying to figure out with these many 
uh, what do you call this thing? You know, uh, station uh, mark. Uh, normally, you know, it's called the ternary operator. Ternary operator. It's the, only, it's the only one with three arguments. Yeah. So it's not a binary operator. It's a ternary operator. And with these many ternary operators, I ended up uh, somewhere where I figured out this would be the end of it, I guess. Let's see. Yeah, and here would be an enter. And I would figure out, you know, is the date, does the database exist? Is, is the authentication successful? Blah, blah, blah. There's a whole things of, there are a list of things that are happening in here, uh, which, 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 which are not easy to figure out. Like the, the problem was like, if the DB name equals to yes, then the user, the user did use a password, but if the DB name was no, then the user did not use a password and they did not connect to any. So it, it, it's very complex the way it worked internally. Hence, this many iterary, uh, no, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, what, what was the name? T -t nested. Yeah, nested things happening. Anyway, and the end, I figure out, uh, I do the, you know, this user, this host, this auth, based on the thre thread and the, we get the jail from current thread, TD mm -hmm. prods, PU cred, prison, prison yeah. ID. Uh, and on the host, it would be okay, yeah. yeah, the jail ID. And we would print all of that that was happening by the timestamp user host. So this is what we use for honeypots, you know, in, in my case. So, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you put a jail honeypot and you, you can see using this mm -hmm. script if someone connected to MySQL or not. Basic so to Maria DB or not. This is the basic model that I'm using here. I think it's a nice script. It it does has its its problems, but it's not unusable. Let's put it that way. Uh, <laughs> so uh, and we do use it in production. It it works fine by the default mm -hmm. configuration. Uh, the non-default configuration, like if you disable logging and whatnot, it would be a lot different uh, way to use. And it sucks. Like it this is not a good way of doing this. They should have not removed the detrace, you know, things. But, um. Go on, any thoughts? You 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 might know Dtrace better than I do. The question is who's, no, the problem is that nobody stepped up uh, to maintain them after the split. Yeah. And if you don't have the relevant platform around to do regression testing, it will just rot away. Yeah, absolutely. One, two, three, right? One, two, three, and then all of that. And then the print in the separate line. Yeah, there you go. So yeah, th this is what my, my one of my favorite D-Tracer scripts look like. And I also did the same for post so you, What you're doing is you're logging uh, the logging attempts. Yes, all of the logging attempts with the databases and the possible authentication. Although I do also have to say that this model, uh, I, think, I think I have one for mm -hmm. tracing, for tracing not just... Let's see. It's a reason why you need a full MariaDB server to uh, capture this. Go again. What do you mean by that? So someone finds a public IP address with MariaDB running. Okay. Or something running on the default MySQL port. Probably, okay. Right? Okay. And they will just send their locking attempts or malicious SQL statements to you. Okay. And you probably want to record them, do some frequency analysis and so on on them. But how often are we seeing which exploit from where oh, and so well, on? Well, first of all, we don't put this on the public internet. Like that's that's the first misconception about honeypots in the first place. Like you always want them in your internal infrastructure because you want to know when someone no, got no. in. Okay, <laughs> exactly. So they're basically more like tripwires. More like, uh, yeah, exactly, 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 exactly. So and not a normal honeypot is really something you basically put out there for someone to stumble into. Yeah. Because you want to know what's there and not that something is there which shouldn't be. Okay, so but, exactly. yeah, okay, this kind and, of and, honeypot is. And, and another one in here is actually mm -hmm. also, um, what do you call that? Um, uh, damn it, I forgot its name. Um, like, 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 we would actually create users and databases in here and put the credentials mm -hmm. all around the place and then wait for an attacker to hack into the actual prod. They're like looking around. Oh, here's a MySQL mm -hmm. credential. Maybe it's commented out. Maybe it's in the my, con the 
the my config that they call it, right? And okay, this might be yeah. useful. They connect, you figure out you got hacked. But interestingly, there is actually a function that they used to have, which is called, and I'll just put it here uh, as a comment. I'll just do it this way, which is called this. It's called PID target. It's called dispatch SQL command. Now this used to exist. I don't know if it got changed or what happened in there. I actually have no idea. Mm -hmm. And this was able to... Uh, show us the actual SQL query as well, right? Right now, I'm not able to see the SQL query as far as I remember uh, with, with this current script, right? Mm -hmm. and, and they also had also another one that looked like that, which was called, uh, which was called um, uh, log ACL connect, ACL log connect. Like these were actual functions that you would see and be like, okay, mm -hmm. I know what this does. This logs the fucking connection. I can see what's happening in here and I can just you trace mm -hmm. that. But now, no, now I have to do all of this to get the same result, right? Because apparently software engineers don't know how to write code. Uh, so yeah, this is the long story short of my favorite D-Trace scripts. So, you, but you're using it uh, in read-only mode, not in destructive mode, right? Absolutely, absolutely. We don't use destructive mode at all. Yeah, we don't use destructive mode at all, yeah. Because if you really wanted to be in uh, and saying you or my, well, you could configure it maybe like this with some external authentication provider mm -hmm. to let them in and allow everything. Yeah, right. Or to uh, rewrite, or you could use destructive D-trace to change the credentials into a, mm -hmm. a valid password mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so that before before entering the password validation function, it would uh, just replace the password with a valid password. Or, or, or as far as I can tell in destructive mode, you can also replace the return. So you could just change the return to, yeah, it logged in. Yeah, yeah. that too, but um, maybe you want to, sure, well, that's probably more elegant, yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. But to just change the return value into the and and, yeah, and now and now everyone can log in, right? But you would still yes. capture, yeah, yeah. That that's a good point. That's actually a very good point. I don't know because then you, you learn more about them. And the other thing you may want to look into is to tap it them. Tap. Uh, to slow down any network traffic. Okay. to a crawl, but not so much that scripts uh, disconnect. Yeah. So to slow down the attack to something that maybe the alert will reach you in time before their uh, probing scripts finish. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Just basically give them a lot to find, a lot of slow exactly. honeypots to find. Exactly. Uh, like you would do with spammers. Yeah. Um, or used to do. I love the BGP uh, SpamD project, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, sadly, it has been uh, abandoned because the uh, original awesome. operators are, have run out of time, but it's a really great idea that you basically subscribe to a feed of... Um, Whitelisted and blacklisted source addresses mm -hmm. via BGP so that you get a real time feed of uh, spam scores mm -hmm. as uh, attributes on a route. And then you could feed this into your uh, Open BGPD in your PF queuing rules to limit them to one byte per second of network mm -hmm. throughput or something. And fragment the traffic using the SPAMD tarpet, which replies one byte per packet and one packet mm -hmm. per second, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> to basically keep them, the spammers, uh, yeah, keep them in a tarpet. Yeah. So they don't use a lot of your resources and won't attack anyone else with this connection slot. Yeah. Uh, That's a good point. But for a honeypot in a Enter inside an enterprise network, having a lot of slow but not quite as slow instances mm -hmm. of something, basically yeah. something for the attacker to 
waste time on. Yeah, I could, and give I, could, you... I, could, I could, I could, I could easily imagine what you're saying here, like having a large database of if you have a big Elasticsearch cluster. Or yeah, something like that. And like the, now the attacker is trying to download all the content, but like I'm, I'm, you're not really limiting them to a byte per second, but more like, you know, a megabyte per second. They're like, oh, yeah, it's working. That and something <laughs> so that downloading it takes a day or two. Yeah. yeah. Which will probably attempt, but while they're doing it, they um, will probably, um, first of all, you can see a spike of traffic on this address. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And even if you only have something like, uh, I don't know, um, <sighs> IP fix or something, uh, mm -hmm. just flow records. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. even if you have an acceptably low uh, filtering uh, threshold, you will see that, oh, we're really seeing some traffic from the honeypot to the outside time to sound the alarm, whatever else is happening, someone is mm -hmm. looking intensively at the them. Well, which, that, which does give, bring me to a good question that you just talked about, which is, and I think this also applies to jails in production, mm -hmm. which is, uh, is there a way to tag packets on the IP layer? Uh, Define I, tag. So here's my idea. So let's say I want to, let's say I have a web server, right? I have a web server yes. inside a jail. And that web server is going to talk to SQL, and that SQL is going to talk to another yes. SQL for some reason, and that web server is going to talk to a uh, what? What else can we have in there? Let's say it's going to talk to uh, a no. Let's SQL. say you have your normal something like a next cloud. You have a and yeah, exactly. and X, You have exactly. fast CGI exactly. and a database, and it's exactly. all done via TCP on three exactly. different hosts. Exactly. So what I want to think about is like I'm running TCP dump on the bridge that hosts all of these three e pairs, right? Yes. Uh, I was wondering, is there a way to to like if 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 the traffic is going from one jail to another jail, you can see that, right? It it goes like you know TCP sequence and then TCP sequence and then TCP sequence. You can figure out that. But what if it's going from here to here and from here to there? So from mm -hmm. zero to one and from one, is there a way to tag packets? I don't think that's technically possible, right? Unless like you're doing on the HTTP layer. Well, then... it depends on what, how your network looks. Okay. So within just your normal TCP IP uh, connection, there is no place for this information. Right. But if you have some kind of encapsulation in between, you could have such a place. So we're talking chain. VXLAN. For example, For example, VXLAN or GIE or something you cobble together with NetGraph or whatever. There's so many different ways to approach this or just implicitly embedding it in the IPv6 address plan, the information. With IPv6, you have enough entropy in there that you could give basically embed the jail ID in the IP address. Encapsulation like VXLAN. What was the other one that you suggested? G. Uh, GR... Generic routing encapsulation. GRE. Uh, mm -hmm. You can do, then you have uh, about a dozen different ways of doing it with NetGraph. With IPv6, you can just embed the jail ID into the uh, no, NetGraph is separate from IPv6. Oh. With IPv6, you can uh, just en embed the jail ID into the IPv6 host address. Just allocate a slash 69 or larger per uh, if we the jail host, then you will have uh, enough bits in the IPv6 address to assign each jail a unique um, yeah. IPv6 address within this prefix. Yeah. Which uh, is That's a good one. the most elegant ways of doing this. That's a good one. So, so the reason why I was thinking about this is, let, let's say, let's say an attacker got into a jail. And then yes. from that jail, they got into another jail. Now, this could be honeypots like we use, or it could be actual sure. production systems. Uh, I was wondering, like, if there is there a way to, quote, unquote, track that, okay, they first got into this jail, and then into that jail. You can do It's so things. complex. Um, mm, well, with the IPv6 uh, 
stuff, it's easy because it's just embedded in the IP address in the lower bits. So it's easy but, to decode. But you wouldn't know, right? Like this is the, like it could be either a regular packet of HTTP connection from the web server to Nextcloud, or it could be the attacker's traffic. Like you would not know that. In none of the cases you described, you would implicitly know if it's an, e unless you said the evil bit. <laughs> the evil bit, <laughs> that's a cute one, okay. And you know, there's an actual RFC for that. Seriously? An RFC for that? Yeah, it's an April Fool's Day RFC, oh, but sure. it's an actual RFC from 2003. Okay, okay. It, uh, so... Uh, <laughs> basically use a reserve bit to mark it as a, and uh, it's a, this is evil and, okay the thing is they, that you can use firewalls um, to uh, set or clear this bit yeah basically clear it on input set it on anything from this jail yeah um, yeah, this, this is actually a very nice April Fool's Day. Okay, that, this, this is a yeah. good one. Sorry, but the, so, yeah. So, so one option that I do have in my mind is um, like, like, well, no, I don't. I honestly don't. I'm not sure that I do. It's, it would be a very, like, it, it's not impossible, but it requires so many changes in so many the, parts of the system to be actually, to actually have a real level bit, you know, like, like, like if you know that you have, um, if you know that this machine is a honeypot, then yes. maybe everything that comes out of that from the VXLAN should be tagged forever. Uh, for then, example, using IPFW or PF, yeah. you can set this bit okay. in the IP header. Okay. You can actually use it like that inside your network. You just have to make sure that you inspect it in the right places. It's really a tongue in cheek joke that you can't trust this information, but there is a reserved bit for you to mess with. <laughs> uh, with IPv6, you could do it with flow labels or an additional uh, host Oh my title. God. Oh my God. XMPP added malicious stanzas. Oh my God. I did Just, not know about this. <laughs> yeah, it's a joke. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Google added evil equals true. <laughs> well, Google would. <laughs> yeah, they should have done that. Um, <laughs> it's uh, just about right from a timing point of view. They shouldn't exactly. have removed it. Exactly. Okay. No, this is this is cute. This is this is very <laughs> nice one. Okay. Yeah. For example, just like uh, web servers replying with uh, HTTP for HTTP four five one uh, yeah. to indicate censorship. Yeah. yeah, yeah. After the book Fahrenheit 501, yeah. the supposed uh, point of ignition for paper. Where all the books are burned. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this, this is a very, very, very nice apple. Okay, now this is good. Okay, but we did we did go off topic. So mm -hmm. you, you have a good point. Like from 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 a honeypot point of view as well as a, a production point of view, tagging some of the, what you could do yeah. if all of the whole Honeypot network exists on a single host. Yeah, of course you can do that indeed. If you, you, and the, you know, if you have a bunch of VNet enabled or mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. alias based jails on the same one system working together as a complex honeypot, then everything that's coming looking out of like that a system, full rack rough of vulnerable crap. Exactly, and then everything that's coming out of that system can have uh, some kind of a bit attached to it. I'm not sure if enterprise. Routers or switches can, you know, search by the evil bit. But I mean, from they from... can often most of the time you can basically say, give them a bit mask or a mm -hmm. lo list of bits in the header to match against, and you can mm -hmm. match this with a bit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That that's so very basically important. it may be so that's easy to. One of the reasons why you would want to do it this way is that uh, a lot of the attackers can't look at this bit because they only look at the TCP payloads. So they I can't see, look at yeah. the headers. Yeah. 
Yeah, and they're looking so they, at, and, and if they gain the root access on a VNet enabled jail, assuming even that the VNet enabled jail does actually have BPF running, it's but there's WhatsApp a lot of a bit on anything exactly. coming from. Yeah, it would be happening in new connection. Out. Yeah, and, and, and so, you so could so have a stateful firewall. Everything that's coming outside of that honeypot mm -hmm. host with the jails, the jails mm -hmm. honeypot, the honeypot jails would have that bit enabled, so operators can track of what happened with it. And anything that's coming back would remove it, so attackers wouldn't know that we know. Yeah. <laughs> One possible use of this would be to basically have a, a honeypot tag all of the traffic at things uh, does not belong to an incoming connection. Mm -hmm. So anything sourced from the honeypot, mm -hmm. and then have, for example, maybe your data loss, whatever, um, mm -hmm. magic look very deeply on mm -hmm. this, or just make sure that we cannot reach out to the rest of your network and use the honeypot as a proxy mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to get in behind your security. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And but still allow them to go out to the internet. Yes. And ha if the traffic is just tagged like this, it's a lot easier for some kind of ASIC-based router to be configured in such a way that the Vizlian just look at this bis bit and do it all at line rate instead of requiring them to uh, to anything stateful in the core, which could be uh, easily um, exhausted as a resource. Anytime mm -hmm. you have to track connection state, it doesn't scale arbitrarily far. Yeah, that, that's a very good point. That's, uh, this is actually a real use case. Like I would love, I, I will try to implement this uh, into our it's, solution as well. It's easy to do with IPFW or PF. Yeah, yeah. You just have to really understand that why it is a joke because yeah. You can't trust it, except between trusted systems where you basically don't need it, unless it's to petition the tagging. But you could do other things like, for example, uh, yeah, VXLAN, uh, IP and IP tunneling, and something where it's potentially even trustworthy is to use something FreeBSD specific, which is FreeBSD can have IPsec policies per socket mm -hmm. or per interface. Mm -hmm. So what you can do is have uh, sockets with IPsec policies attached to them and then basically use the IPsec uh, security association mm -hmm. so that you have an SPI index mm -hmm. there and then mm -hmm. track this. And even it's even encrypted end to end. So yeah, you, you kind of can tag a session like this. Netcat even does that if you have a strong swan generating the keys. Yep. And on demand, you can have just use Netcat as an IPsec transport mode proxy. Yep. It's annoying to set up, but once you but only because it's such a underdocumented and overly flexible key exchange protocol. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The actual data plane is say is fine. This this is actually very interesting. I, I should dig into it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, do you have any of the tracer scripts that you would like to share, share or do you use the, whatever comes with FreeBSD? Uh, sure, I use the ones and okay, the D old DTrace toolkit from ports. Mm -hmm. There's still a lot of useful ones there. Um, Where is it, by the way, in ports? Any idea? I think it would be in Sys. DTrace dash toolkit. Sys. Sys hotels, most probably. Sys utils, probably. And it may be written in uppercase, yeah. This one, yeah. There we go. Where no, is it fetching yeah. from GitHub? Great. Some of them are Solaris specific. Yeah, some of them are even like a lot of them are also uh, deprecated, like like the because the code bases have changed, etc. So. Yeah, and they have always some of them have always been uh, deprecated, basically because they're targeting unstable APIs which just happen to not have changed. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Stuff like this. Um, we should look into uh, updating the toolkit. That that might actually be interesting. Or shipping some good DTracer scripts with the operating system. You know, mm -hmm. uh, a that, few that... of them are shipped with them. For example, oh, really? for the 
yeah, FreeBSD does ship some. All right, uh, let's deal. Think for the FreeBSD operating uh, system design codes, for example. So imports, no, sorry, not imports. In source, we should have, I'm guessing it's in user S, no. It would, uh, it would be in share. Look in your installed system where they go. I, I think I think it's part of DWatch. So which DWatch? No, it's not just DWatch. It's uh, there are some scripts for glue to make use of, for example, the TCP and so on provider, the NFS oh, provider. I've I never uh, noticed. So let's see if we do if we do uh, so we do ls uh, something slash something dot d. We would mm -hmm. get, I couldn't find anything, but I'm not, <clears throat> no, I did it wrong. Um, I, did it. I probably did it wrong. I probably did it wrong. Yeah. I th Use lib dtrace. Lib dtrace? And yes. Your user lib dtrace. Oh, user lib dtrace. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Yeah, there, there, there are good ones in here. There's like TCP.d and there is Signal. Yeah. Stuff, for example, to decode uh, TCP states from bit masks to mm -hmm. human readable strings and stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, hyper code. Uh, here, here's another detrace question that is also gel oriented. And by the way, I can't seem to, and I might be... Uh, I mean, user has been right. D watch. I can't seem to find it. Maybe it just installs in there. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure where it actually is. Which D watch? Uh, you, so user has been. Yeah, it, it should be in user has been something, but I can't seem to find D watch in here. Okay, well, we'll we'll find it. That's okay. So here here's a good question. So so let, let's say you have a um, user has been, not user bin. Yeah, user has been. I wasn't user has been, wasn't I? D watch? No, it's not in here. What Maybe about... it's under convert, contrib. Oh, that's a good point. That is a good point. A, B, C, E, nope, not in here as well. Yeah, we do have to find that somewhere. Actually, it would be a good idea to, to just search in here dwatch because that's the only dwatch that we have. Uh, CDDL, it's a subdirectory. It's a directory at the top level. Um. Uh... Hard links, uh, let's see, add DWatch to the list. It's in, no, this is the man page change. It's in CDDL user as bits. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, you see DL user, okay. I wonder why. Because why? it's under the CDDL. User as there we go. Okay, DWatch. Okay, there we go. Examples, etc. But here should be libexec. And here is what they call uh, well, I don't know what it's called exactly, but for example, there's IP and it's, it's, it, these are very good scripts. Like they do a lot of, so m my question is something else. My question is, um, where did you show me that thing? It was in lib, right? It was in lib dtrace, hmm? lib dtrace. Nope, user lib. find it. A oh, user lib dtrace. User lib. Maybe it's also in Contrib or CDDL. It's uh, look for a file named ipfw.d. Let's do that. Let's go back to the tree in here. Let's do ipfw.d. There we go. And that would be n. Come on, get search. Search now. Uh, it would be in tools build. No, not in here. <laughs> no, no, that uh, no, the path was there for you to look at because it changed. No. Oh, no. I see what you mean. In the change, we would see it. Okay. Uh, user lib dtrace. I still can't find it. Oh, it's user. Yeah, user lib dtrace. I did not know that. So it would be in user. Wait, what? No. That's the destination. That, that was the path of the de destination. So yeah, it would there's be... a go to. Now we need a tool in FreeBSD where you do like something, something, and you give it a path of the thing that is in base, and it would tell you where its source is. That would be a very useful tool. Uh, 
Um, well, with package base, the package co rich command. It's in share. Tell it's you. in share. It's in share D trace. It's in share. So, uh, if you have a package base, yeah, in the package base it would yeah, share D trace. There we go. Okay, so here's my question. <laughs> let's go to something that is IP based. So let's say um, uh, these are different than what we have. That's what than what I have in my system, by the way very much different like very very much different did they change something did they change like paths or whatever i feel like they did maybe they have um so there's like ip do you have it do you have ip.d in your directory jan are you here Yes, I just muted myself. So oh, sorry. Thank you. Sorry, sorry, sorry. So I uh, have IP.d, but I don't know the source of that. I don't see the source of that. Why are you bad in search? Jesus, IP.d. Okay. Uh, how am I even going to find that? I, is there like exact search, like Google, or am I overthinking it? Why are you restricting yourself to a web interface instead of your own uh, clone of a repository? Because uh, I want to do it in the web interface because, you know, because other people are do watch our videos. Okay. <laughs> so here, here, here's why I'm asking that, actually. Um, mm -hmm. So why I'm asking that. So so actually, let, let's do that. Let's, let's actually go back to what we found before, which would be here. Okay, good. Let's go into, for example, a TCP state. This is a good one. So uh, this has, oh, this is just a very basic old state, new state. No, I'm not looking for this. So uh, the oh, IP.d oh. is installed from cddl lib, lib d trace. Thank you. Let's do that. So cddl lib, where was it? The lib d trace? Yes. Lib lib trace. Okay. Lib lib trace. Thank you. Thank you. So here's a oh yeah, these are yeah, these are good. So let's go to ip.d. And this is a very nice one, which you know depends on kernel module provider, etc. Very, very good pragmas, very good structs that is free BSD based. Do you think this can be like jail aware where it would be like um hey, uh, run this D script? This depends. This what? It depends. Go on. If it's really happening at the packet processing level, mm -hmm. at the IP packet level on, in the network stack, mm -hmm. there is no process to be jailed associated with this packet directly. I see what you mean. Because let's say you're a router. Mm -hmm. You get a packet in on one interface. You do a routing lookup, maybe some stateful firewalling or whatever, and you forward it across out on another interface. Mm -hmm. Nowhere along this path was there ever a user space process involved. Mm -hmm. Pure for packet forwarding the kernel. We have some serious issues on FreeBSD. I'm running the IP.d command and it's saying yep. pipe pre-declared struct packet info. Hmm? Michael is calling. Yes, we are still meeting. We don't uh, know when to stop. Uh, so, um, the thing okay. So this is, it says that this is redefined. So either my code is bad or something is actually, so let's see. Oh, you okay. kind of um, didn't follow the upgrading steps maybe? I am not sure. I am actually not sure. And maybe you have a mixture of some old D-trace scripts or struct definitions and so on around. I mean, I do update using FreeBSD update, which, which I mean, I don't update with source. So it should that handle should. all of that. Sure. No. But I don't know if it re deletes old files, which aren't libraries or executables. Uh, how do we get the link? No, we used to put like a link inside the uh, uname that says if this is uh, compiled on FreeBSD's machine or our machine, you know, like it uh, used to have, you remember that? Like, yeah, but the, I know, but the problem with this is that it prevents the, all the information in there, it, it included a build timestamp, which um, makes the build automatically non uh, reproducible. Yeah. 
yeah and stuff like this and you don't want to put for reproducible builds you don't want to put things like the build machine in there because again it's only reproducible on the system then yeah so they removed and that. so all this whole thing got removed and you just see a dollar free bsd dollar yeah yeah got it yeah and i do see that yeah yeah Okay, and yeah. one of it was one of the and most annoying things during system updates when you had hundreds of rc.d scripts, and the only thing which changed with uh, the old merge master especially was uh, the version number of rc uh, the rc yeah. script because it's now the freebsd n plus one version of the exactly same script with no other changes. Thank you for wasting my time enter 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 good point so so yep. uh, so so so, the, the, so the, okay so uh, assumingly i did not use source compile i can check user source yeah I, I might have i might have i have no idea i have no idea also how to check i'm used even if it's no longer necessary i'm just used to uh building everything from source and keeping my object directory around because for the longest time I had to do it this way. And once you have meta mode enabled and a populated object directory, it's just not slower than doing it with binary packages because the build system will just not rebuild unnecessary objects and then it's fast enough. Mm. Package pages may get me out of there, but... Here we have GLIDs. Yeah. Here we have GLIDs. For I example, yeah. But what I wanted to say about yeah, yeah, if of you course. have Stop. a TCP Stop. connection yeah. mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. there's a, something like a send or receive system call, mm -hmm. then you have a process invoking the system call. Of course. Of so, course. So you're in the upper part of the network stack at the socket API. There you have, can uh, get a GLID. Of course. But there's a process associated with this. We, we do have something in here which just says zone ID, by the way. Yeah, I have no idea what that JLID. is. ID. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, okay. That's a good point. So I, I don't know if, if 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 the system is less or so like I know in Solaris it is, by the way, because on Solaris mm -hmm. you can you can do that. You can run D trace on the IP a subsystem and say I want to see the IP of you yes, know Yes, has that. Right. Wait, so does that mean that this script would work? To say, show me of only this VNet, basically. If the script runs, of course, in the first. Um, this is VNet. This is the jail ID. This would be at the system call level. Okay. So what? What VNet is orthogonal to this? It's a system call. There's a process performing the system call. The process is, has a jail ID. Mm. The processes has have jail ID. Yes. Yes, of course. If there's a process associated with it, you can recover a jail ID and everything else associated with the jail from this. But from an if IP perspective, but from an IP from an, an IP packet, it's normally not associated with a process. It's a network packet. Okay, so but think of it this way: like the the the, 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 a, the a VNet jail has a separate TCP/IP stack, right? A separate IP stack. Yes. A separate a separate, stack. Well, it has the same code, but all of the once global variables have been replaced, including the default routing table, exactly. the list of interfaces, exactly, and all the other state. Basically, you just index all the one. No, otherwise, global variables by JLID. That's you... basically what the image is. Yes. Okay. So basically, every global variable in the network stack gets replaced by an array of variables yes. indexed by JLID. Of course. Which means technically it would be possible. Which to... means with that with D-trace, if you look at a point in the code, you do not, the J, D, VNet enabled jail does not have its own copy of the network stack instructions, only the state. Oh, so, now I got you. 
if right. you so if you trace a system work. call or a kernel but, function using dtrace, yes. vnet is an argument to it. Right. You, at some point, you may see the jail idea and then go it through a macro to do the indexing into the vnetted variable. Right. So, so if I run this on a host machine, it's going to show me everything that's happening on the host as well as happening in the jail. Everything happening on the system. Everything happening on the system. But at in some place, maybe in, in some place, it might have a, 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 a bit of data that says but, on which VNet this is happening. Yes, or... and there are some other things useful, which mm -hmm. um, is there can be, a f I think, 32 or bit or a cookie associated with a, if just a user-provided ID passed mm -hmm. along inside the kernel structs with sockets. Mm -hmm. So this way mm -hmm. you can, for example, tag it, and then you can have uh, put additional tags in there. Mm, uh, so, yeah. Okay. And then now you I can use it. this to, for example, tag uh, things like uh, associate a VLAN tag with a packet and then yep. pass it to the network driver as this is a Ethernet frame belonging on this VLAN. And then the driver can either generate the encapsulation and send it out or tell the suitably advanced networking chip, hey, send this on this VLAN, you know what to do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Allowing so, it to uh, do things like uh, TCP large send optimization mm -hmm, on mm -hmm. VLAN tagged packets. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Let's let's do something interesting. So let's do this. Let's do. You no, know, uh, let's uh, call it a day. Um, <laughs> I you have to. Uh, You've never done this at before? least for. Hmm? <laughs> You've never what? left early before. Okay. Yeah, I have to do something. Uh, we can continue this in twenty minutes or so. It's okay. So I'm just going to also uh, put in here, uh, let's do this, just that. Also check out the mm -hmm. dtrace scripts, scripts so that come with the base system at, and we did find the location, right? We did find the location where, oh God, Jesus. Um, maybe I can do something like this. See it. Oh, there we go. So see you tomorrow. I have no idea. See you tomorrow. And he left. Um, okay. Let's do user. I'm the only one left, by the way, in the call. Let's do user. Let's do uh, CDDL share. No. Uh, lib. It would be libdtrace. Here we go. Here is what's shipped with the operating system. There we go. And close. Okay. Oops. What did I do there? Okay. Q. Okay. Uh, well, thank you everyone for staying with us. And everyone left one by one. And um, like and subscribe. Uh, thank you very much. A meeting adjourned at, it's almost 12 o'clock in here. Uh, TC now would be that. Okay. There is a, a website for that. That's good to know. UTC now. Oh, Jesus. Okay. Let's do it that way. UTC. Uh, cheers.